have been underground in Gaza for 32 days. My name is Rachel, and I am the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Poland. The last time I saw Hirsch was on Friday night, October 6th. You met the Pope, Pope Francis. Elon Musk was very sincere in listening to Hirsch's story. Hirsch took refuge in a bomb shelter before being captured. That's Hirsch on the right with another hostage. His left hand and part of his arm is blown off. I mean, what parent wants to see their child more, you know, critically wounded? You gain strength. What the world needs to start thinking about today is what will your excuse be? You had the opportunity to meet with President Biden. Is there anything you can tell us about that exchange you had? President Biden has been the most. Thank you so much for clicking on this weekend's episode of the Meaningful People podcast. We had a super important conversation with a mother in pain. Uh, her son, Hirsch Goldberg Poland, is currently being held in Gaza. He has grave injuries based on the videos that they've seen of him being abducted. And uh, the efforts to, to get him home have not stopped for a second. In this conversation, we discuss a lot about that. Her conversations with elected officials like President Biden, um, a little bit about her son, Hirsch, who he is, what he's about, and a lot more. So listen big in this episode. A lot of, a lot of things were said that we all can gain from. Um, I do want to say that anytime we do an episode like this regarding Israel and what's going on, there's always a lot of comments that, that come on on YouTube. Uh, some have nothing to do with what we're even discussing in terms of innocent lives, hostages being held. So I implore each and every one of you who is watching to flood the comments with positivity. The positivity for the families that are watching that still have hostages held there for positivity for every single human being that has compassion for Israel they're in this war so please use the comments as a place you understand that tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people will see what you write there please comment accordingly I want to give a big thank you to our friends at Albert and Associates for sponsoring this episode your financial security your financial uh, freedom is is really important to you and that's why the first phone call you need to make right now is to Moshe Alpert at 718-644-1594 or email him at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. I work with him. He takes care of me. And he can do the same for you. So make that phone call, set up a consultation, and take it to the next step. I'm telling you, you will be happy. Uh, maybe you're coming back from seminary. Maybe you're just getting started in dating and marriage. Finances are important and they could really be a stress in your life if you don't have things figured out correctly. Um, Take the step, make sure you're doing your part. Obviously, everything comes from God, but there's stuff for you to do. And uh, a good place to start is making that phone call to Moshe Albert today. Let's so give him a call. Also, I want to give a big thank you to Town Appliance. I spoke to my friends at Town Appliance just the other day, and so many of you have reached out to the number one appliance store since 1979. Some of you have used them for new construction, custom kitchens, to replace old appliances and bring in the new appliances. Of course, many of you have taken advantage of their new winter sales you go to townappliance.com or you message them on whatsapp the feedback has been absolutely incredible thank you for supporting a supporter of the meaningful people podcast and like let's be real we all are in need of appliance at some point of our life make sure to go to townappliance.com today now here's the episode you are listening to the meaningful people podcast the podcast featuring our nation's most impactful influential and meaningful people Thank you so much uh, for joining us. I wish it was under better circumstances, um, but, but thank you for giving us your time. I want to start out by, by asking you if you can just you know, share with us a little bit more about your family. Uh, I know you were born in the United States. I guess, you know, take us from there and what events led you to moving to Israel? Okay. So um, my husband and I were both born and raised in Chicago. Uh, he grew up in a very traditional Orthodox family. I grew up in a non-affiliated Jewish family. Um, but I ended up at the same high school that he was at, the Orthodox Jewish high school in Chicago. And um, after high school, I came to Israel for a year, and then I went to Brandeis. Um, my husband, who 
we had gone to the same high school together. We were friends. We weren't boyfriend, girlfriend. We were just friends. He came to Israel for a year for yeshiva. And then he went to Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin. And we both ended up being in Israel um, at the same time after we had each graduated. And we ran into each other on the street. And one thing led to another. We started dating and we got married here. But we were, he was a student here. I was also a student. Um, you know, I was actually learning Torah. He was uh, getting a second degree, a business degree. And uh, we ended up getting married here, but we weren't ready. When I say we weren't ready, I think I wasn't ready to make Aliyah and spend the rest of my life here yet. So we ended up moving to Berkeley, California, which was a big adventure. Um, yeah, you know, I would say that's almost maybe even the opposite of Israel. Exactly. Well, that was, you know, part of yeah. the adventure was, you know, we didn't have kids yet. We didn't have a mortgage. If we were going to do something wild and fun, that was the time to do it. And we both loved hiking and, and camping and John loved biking. And um, we needed a religious community that, but that was kind of more progressive and liberal, but observant. And friends of ours said, you know, you'd really like Berkeley. So we ended up in Berkeley, California, and it was amazing. The community was wonderful. Hirsch was born there. We say that's why he, you know, tended to be more hippie, crunchy granola because it was sort of, yeah. you know, in the water when he was a baby. And uh, his sister, Libby, was also born there in Berkeley. And when Hirsch was almost four, we moved to Richmond, Virginia, which was going from one uh, kind of Jewish community on the spectrum to the complete opposite <laughs> community. Yeah. An another <laughs> wonderful community, but very much more um, traditional than we were, um, you know, most of our good friends were wearing black hats and, uh, you know, white shirts and black pants. And um, we had a great experience in, in Richmond, loved it. Uh, and then when Hirsch, the summer before he turned eight, um, we moved and uh, came to Israel. And we also had a, another daughter when we were living in Richmond. So Hirsch is the yeah. oldest and only boy, and then uh, two girls who are now 20 and 18. And we've lived in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, what motivated us to move was really this idea of we have an opportunity to live in a place where you can be Jewish and comfortable. And let's get on the ride. It's something that, yeah. you know, in 2000 years, not everyone had the opportunity to do. Let's try it. I, I imagine it's been uh, it's been home. It's been it's been a good place for you guys. Definitely, and uh, you know our kids have had a foot in each world. I mean, for us, I think it's a bit it's always a bit hard if you come as an adult by a certain age. You kind of miss that window where you're going to really feel a hundred percent comfortable. We were almost forty right. when we got here, but um, oh, ancient, totally ancient. I know, elderly, and. Um, yeah. But we um, have been very happy and we felt very privileged. And um, I think that there's a real gift of giving your children the ability to you know, speak and live in two languages and two cultures. And that's been our... Uh, I uh, always say on here, we have many different guests, many, many of which who live, in, who live in Israel. And it always comes down to a lot. You know, I remember something uh, Rabbi Shlomo Katz said. He said that the the future of the Jewish people is in Israel. That's just that's where it is. Mm. So uh, if you want to live part of the future of the Jewish people, you're either going to come later, or you're going to come now. So mm. you made the decision. I'm going now. Yeah. So it seems like you uh, you as well did that. Um, if you could, I guess, tell us a little bit about about Hirsch, uh, who he is. Sure. So you know, just you know, it's important, I think, to to lay the foundation. You know, I see. You know, you have a number on your on your shirt over there and it's, that's not a brand 74. It's been, it's been 74 days since you, you had contact with your son. Right. And, um, it's super important that everyone who's watching this doesn't just know the situation. They know who your son is and they know right. who you are. Right. So I, I guess tell us, tell us about Hirsch. So Hirsch is a very curious, respectful, very smart, um, funny, 
but funny, sarcastic with like this dry sense of humor, but it's not mean because usually sarcasm goes a little bit mean, but Hirsch is not, yeah. doesn't do that. He's a very respectful person who's not mean. Um, he is a voracious reader. He started to read young and quick and became obsessed with reading. And so he would sweep a category. You know, he got interested in Native Americans and we would go to the library and he would read 20 books in a row about Native Americans. Or he went through a Civil War period. Um, he uh, went through an American president period where he would read about every single American president. Um, and uh, he also was very obsessed with um, geography. He had a wonderful teacher at... Um, his day school in Richmond, Virginia. And she um, fostered in him this love of geography. So he um, has had wanderlust and been obsessed with the idea of traveling the world since he was in first grade. And um, he's been actually, and every birthday or, you know, for his bar mitzvah, he always asked for maps and atlases and globes and mm. always had a subscription to National Geographic magazine. Um, always knew trivia because of all of his reading. You always wanted him on your team if there was any sort of trivia game being played. Um, mm. And he actually has a ticket for next week for December 27th for Goa, India, where he was going to start his trip around the world that he's been planning since he was six. Um, wow. That was going to take, he, he had told us it would be at least a year, but probably two. So we were aware that he and was been planning this since he was six. Since, yes. Yes. And so this summer he actually did a quote unquote practice trip of nine weeks by himself in Europe. He went to six different countries, six different music festivals. Um, he went alone in Switzerland, he met a friend from Israel who was, you know, meeting him there and they went to that music festival together. But otherwise he loved, he's just a curious person. He loves meeting new people, finding out about them, asking hard questions, getting good answers, um, or insisting on getting good answers, you know, pushing yeah. until people really would answer. And he also, he's wild about soccer. He's a diehard uh, Hapoel Jerusalem fan soccer fan, um, very active in their fan group, which, um, you know, they do all these activities for coexistence with the Arab population here in Jerusalem and at risk kids, uh, youth in Jerusalem. And, um, that's a little slice of who Hirsch is. Yeah. You know, the, the, the way I, I see things, there are sort of two tragic situations here. You know, there's your personal matter um, with the situation and the condition of your son. And the second is sort of the national tragedy uh, for Israel. Do you, do you feel that? In, and how do you reconcile the parallel emotions of sort of having, you know, what took place at large with the entire, the entire nation and, and what's going on with you in your home, with your personal situation? Well, with this type of situation with thank which thank god um not many people ever experience it's so all encompassing and it's so excruciating that there's not a lot of room to digest the larger picture of what's happening um you know just getting up and pretending to be human you know just putting in these ear earbuds yeah, even and, doing this. and talking to you and yeah. trying to appear like a normal person when I'm actually in, you know, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and even physical pain. And it's not even pain. It's like excruciating agony is so it involves every molecule of strength that I have that I don't read the news I'm not really up to date on, you know, national news. Um, I'm obviously aware that our country, our people, our nation is going through um, a trauma and tragedy, but we are experiencing a slow motion tragedy and trauma 
that is so acute and 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 so filled with angst and despair that I don't actually have bandwidth left to process what is happening, you know, on the larger national level. Right. No, I, I totally, I totally hear that. And I appreciate the vulnerability and the honesty with that. You know, that makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. We'll be right back to this episode of the podcast, but first a word from our friends at Project Misora. You know, Rabbi Pesach Kron's Chizik and Tefillah trip to Poland is a life changing experience. Everyone will daven at Kivrei Tzedikim, such as Noam Melech, the Ramah, Toysavis, Yom Tov, the Bach, Magila Yamukais, Rav Chaim Brisker, Chidushe Arim, Sas Emes, and many others. So what you can do is you can join Rabbi Pesach Ron as he takes you through Auschwitz, Birkenau, where so many of us lost family members. Rabbi Kron will take you to Yeshiva's Chachmi Lublin to learn about Rabbi Meir Shapiro, the founding of the Dafyomi movement. You will walk the streets of Krakow, Warsaw, Ger, and Lutz, and so many places. Our, our, our history is really rich in these places. You will also see Oscar Schindler's factory, where those on Schindler's list were sheltered from the Nazis, Yemach Shemo, and were given the opportunity to survive. You'll visit Sar Schneer's first base Yaakov and have a chance to daven by your caver. So many girls for the first time were given the chance to receive a Jewish education. This Chizuka and Tefillah trip is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to daven, learn, connect, and most importantly, experience. Project Masora handles everything. Top hotels, fully catered meals, all entrance fees, security, and more. Just bring a sitter with you and be ready for an experience of a lifetime. For more information to reserve your spot, call Project Masora today at 845-570-1943 or email tours at projectmasora.org. Once again, that's 845-570-1943 or tours at projectmasora.org. I want to mention if some of you have grandparents you want to bring, people who maybe are hard of, of walking. Project Masora also offers the option of wheelchairs, scooters. So that should not be something that stops you. Um, if this is something that interests you, please make sure to reach out to Project Masora today. Now back to this episode. If you could take us back personally to October 7th. Sure. Um, to the events that unfolded for you and your family. What, what, what happened? Sure. So I'll start with um, actually the evening of October 6th because um, Hirsch wasn't even supposed to be home at all um, on Friday. He had gone up north on Wednesday the 4th, and he was supposed to be up north from Wednesday the 4th until Sunday the 8th. He was at a music festival up north. But Friday midday, the police came and told the people who were organizing that music festival, that they didn't have the right permits to continue through the weekend. So they closed up that music festival he was at up north, and he called and he said, I'm coming home, so I'll be home tonight for Simchas Torah, and I'll go to shul with you guys, and, um, and I'll go to Shabbat dinner, because we were going to friends. He said, but then Honor and I, that's one of his uh, two closest friends, he said, Honor and I are going to go out and do something fun, you know, after dinner, go camping out somewhere. So he came with us to Shul with his big, you know, not so big, but, but with a camping backpack with his sleeping bag and stuff in it. And we all danced with the Torah at Shul. He danced with the Torah. <clears throat> a lot of people were happy to see him because, as I said, he had been away for nine weeks over the summer, so people hadn't seen him. And then we went to our friends for Shabbat dinner and we had a nice meal. And at just around 11 o'clock, he kissed me, he kissed John, and uh, he hugged our hostess goodbye. And I remember thinking, what a good boy. Um, yeah, and, well. <laughs> yeah, and he said, I'll see you tomorrow. And he left. And that was 74 days ago. Um, and the morning of the 7th, um, at 7.30 in the morning, John left for shul. He's actually the Gabai at our shul. And as you know, for Simchas Torah, you know, it was going to start early because it was going to go long. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, I don't want to be there for five hours, so I'm going to go a little bit later. So I was having a cup of tea at our kitchen table. And right around eight o'clock, the bomb sirens started to go off here in Jerusalem. So I ran to wake up my girls who are 20 and 18 and we went to get into our bomb shelter, which is in our apartment. And we waited the 10 minutes that you're supposed to wait. And we didn't hear any explosions. So we came out 
And I don't use my phone on Shabbos. So it was off and it was in a drawer, but I knew that Hirsch and Honor were out camping somewhere outside where bombs were falling. So I thought, you know, for Pikuach Nefesh, I'm turning on my phone. I got to know where my son is. Right. And I turned on the phone around 8.20. And from 8.11, two messages immediately popped up from WhatsApp um, to a group that John Hirsch and I have, just the three of us. And the first message said, I love you. And the second message said, I'm sorry. And so I immediately knew something horrible was happening. Um, and I said to my older daughter, we need to figure out where the boys are. You know, I tried to call him. It didn't answer. I sent him a text saying, you know, are you okay? Tell me you're okay. I'm going to leave my phone on. Tell me you're okay. Um, obviously those were never answered. Um, and Libby started to check what was happening sort of, you know, within a two hour radius yeah. of us that could be where the boys were. And she found right away the Nova Music Festival. And, you know, as I said, Hirsch had just attended six music festivals. He was wild about music festivals. And On Air was a very accomplished, talented musician. So it made a lot of sense that they would be there. So I wrote to their third best friend, who, thank God, was not in Israel or he would have been with them. And I said, are the boys at this music festival? And the friend wrote back, they're there. So we knew right away that they were there. And then it was really terrifying trying to find where are they. Um, and what we ended up finding out is that when the massacre started taking place early Shabbat morning, uh, Hirsch and Honor and two other kids ran to a car to try to escape in a car. And um, Hamas had blocked the road and were shooting at all the cars coming toward them. Once the cars were very close, they would shoot all the people in the car at point blank range. So there was a huge traffic situation because a bunch of people were dead in the cars in the front. And then all of a sudden, all these other cars trying to escape realized they were trapped. So they ran from the cars and tried to take cover. And there are a bunch of roadside bomb shelters down south next to all the bus stops. So the kids went running into all these bomb shelters, which um, Hirsch ended up in one with 28 other young people who, first of all, were at this music festival called the Music Festival for Unity and Light. So you can sort of picture the demographic of people who were attending. Yeah. And the bomb shelter, John went a couple weeks ago to see it. I, I couldn't do that. Um, it was five feet by eight feet. So you can picture wow. 29 people. 28 people, yeah. Yeah, mashed in this tiny windowless uh, cement bomb shelter. And Hamas came and started throwing in hand grenades, which Honor was standing in the doorway and managed to pick up and throw out seven of them. But then three did end up getting by, and right away detonating and causing mass carnage, um, as you can imagine. And then they came to the door with an RPG, which they fired in. And then they just came with machine guns and were firing into this room. Um, so most of those kids were dead right away. A lot of them were injured. And there were a few lucky ones that were trapped under the dead and dying bodies. And they were lucky because they could pretend to be dead. Um, so... We heard from those eyewitnesses that after a few minutes of a lot of dust, and it was very hot in the room, the smoke sort of went out and the dust settled, and a couple of Hamas gunmen came in, and they saw that there were three young men who were slumped against the wall who were wounded but clearly still alive, and they ordered them to stand up. And when they stood up, one of them was Hirsch, and we were told that his left arm from the elbow down had been blown off. Sometime during the lull, uh, he had tied a bandage of some sort or a tourniquet around his uh, wound, and um, they were walked out to a Hamas pickup truck and it headed in the direction of Gaza, and his last phone cell signal was detected at 10.25 in the morning from inside of Gaza. And... Um, 
subsequently, a few days later, um, we were being interviewed by Anderson Cooper on CNN. And at the end of the interview, he said, you guys, I'm calling you, which we thought was suspicious and weird because we had been interviewed a lot and no one ever said they were calling us afterwards. Right. But he called and he said, I have footage of Hirsch being kidnapped. And he sent us footage that he had found while doing a documentary about the music festival. Um, and he recognized from our description of what happened to him. And at the same time that we were talking, you know, the media always puts pictures of the person they're talking about on the split screen. So he was looking right. at pictures of Hirsch pre-October 7th. And he recognized him. And so we got this footage where we see Hirsch walking calmly on his own two feet out of the bomb shelter. He gets himself up onto the truck with his non-dominant hand. Hirsch and I are both left-handed. Um, and when he turns to sit down, you see the stump of where his left arm was. And he doesn't lose consciousness. And I'm sure he was dazed, traumatized, and in shock, he had just seen 18 people killed, including his, you know, close friend. Um, and uh, that's the last that we've seen of him in uh, these past 74 days. As a mother, I'm sure there is, I'm not sure actually, honestly, <laughs> I'm not sure of anything, but you tell me, you know, you, you see this video, so you know you're okay. Your son is alive at that, you know, at that point. But you see who's who's leading him, and those are I wouldn't even call people. It's just evil. And then you see the condition that he's in, the injury. What are those emotions like? Well, so it's interesting when when Anderson Cooper first sent that. I didn't watch it because I didn't want to see that. Um, John watched it a lot. John actually got um, hope and optimism out of it because he felt and continues to feel that, first of all, in this situation, you have to grab onto anything that be can, can be construed as positive um, or hopeful or optimistic. Um, and, you know, in this parallel universe that we currently live in, we say things that normal people would never say. You know, the first thing when we heard that he had been kidnapped was, oh, thank God, because he's not dead. Because right. the other kids who were in there were dead. Um, so, and then when we got the video and John watched it, he said, oh, thank God, it was Hamas. <laughs> you know, these are sentences that normal people would never utter. And we keep having those kind of things happen. Um, I finally did watch the video because we were releasing it to the media and I was scared that it would come back to me, you know, in some sort of surprising way. And I wanted to have seen it. Um, I mean, no parent should ever have to see such a video. Um, and I think through all of this, I've learned a lot about the human psyche how we're able to compartmentalize things in order to survive. Um, so it's sickening to watch that video, but I am able to when I have to. So when I was at the UN last week um, speaking in Geneva, at a certain point I had to show the video to someone who I had met, a diplomat, and I, and I have to kind of show them because they don't know who Hirsch is. So, you know, and on right. that truck, there are other young, young men, and I want them to know this is Hirsch. And I have to say, and that, that thing, that's the stump, you know, where his arm used to be. And so I kind of have to guide them through it. And when I do that, I'm compartmentalizing being his mother and, you know, feeling like, when I watch that video and I see how robotic he seems, how he seems, you know, just dazed and confused, he's just had his arm blown off and his best friend blown up in front of him. And he just walks and walks forward. 
And I think in many ways, 74 days ago, you know, my heart was blown out and I'm just walking forward just like he did because the only way I can save him is if I am in some way functioning. Um, there are a lot of people who can't function right now, which is a hundred thousand percent understandable. But while I can function, it's the only way I can help save him and save them. And so, you know, that's what I do. That's what I try to do every day. We get up and we say, well, we failed because he's still not home. You know, I ask all yeah. these quote unquote important people that we meet. We've met with all these world leaders and uh, different important figures in the world. And I, we always say, what should we be doing that we're not doing? And they often say, you're doing every single thing right. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing every single thing right. And I just today, I came upstairs after someone very, you know, in a very high position in the American government. I had a phone call with him and he said that to me, you're doing every single thing right. And I came up and the team was up here and I said, you know why I know I'm not doing everything right? Because he's still not home. So I'm obviously not doing everything right. And we're not doing everything right. And when I say we, I mean we, the whole world, is not doing everything right. Because these hostages, you know, the composition of these people, they're still from at this point, the hundred plus people who are still held hostage are from 20 different nations. They're Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindu, Buddhists. They range in age now. The youngest has turned 11 months old to 84 years old. Like we are doing something wrong that the whole entire world is allowing this international human catastrophe to continue to happen. Yeah, it's almost unbelievable that it's it's been this long and we're just, you know, days go by and they're still there. Well, and you and, know, and honestly, I don't even know if they are still there. I mean, I can tell you there's no way on earth that they're all still alive because the conditions that we heard about from the hostages who were released are so severe that they are dying and we are letting them die. We, the world, are letting them die. Hey guys, we'll be right back to this episode, but you know, it's dream raffle season and I sat down with Shmuel Sackett, the founder of the dream raffle. This is what he had to say. I am joined by Shmuel Sackett from the dream raffle.com. Here we are again, another year, another apartment to give away the special lucky winner. That's right. And what makes it so special this year is that all of the money <clears throat> being raised in the dream raffle.com goes to help Israel during these challenging times. For example, we are helping farmers rebuild around the Gaza area. We're giving money for what's called Kitot Konanut, the local civilian security teams, lone soldiers, search and rescue. Do you know that we're, the guys are still searching after what happened on October 7th? There are still many missing people, and the Israel Dog Unit is uh, involved searching, and we are uh, helping them with funds from the Dream Raffle. So it's really... Nachi, this year it's a win-win situation. You could win a million-dollar apartment, luxury apartment in the heart of Yerushalayim, and you win by supporting Israel during these very challenging times. That's right. So everyone should head to the dreamraffle.com. Make sure you get your tickets. Use promo code MPP. Um, you have to be in it, you know, because on March 11th, when that drawing date comes, you want the ability, the possibility for your name to be called. But I tell you, there's something even better now. Right now, we're offering two for one. So if you buy one ticket, get Ooh. two, buy three, get six, and so on. And also, we have a bonus raffle. Free of charge, you're entered into a second raffle with a $10,000 cash prize. So how about that? Parmen Yushalayim, oh, wow. $10,000 cash prize, two for one, and use the uh, co a coupon code MPP, Meaningful People Podcast, MPP, and save $10 more off of the tickets, thedreamraffle.com. So you had mentioned, you know, hearing from other hostages. Did, did you have the chance to speak to any of the released hostages? 
did any of them see Hirsch or, or hear of Hirsch when they were there? So none of the ones that um, were released knew of Hirsch. Um, it's not so surprising because most people were held with the people they were kidnapped with. And the people who right. were released were mostly women and children and babies from the kibbutzim. So right. he was not taken with that population. Um, there were three people released from the um, music festival. Two of them were siblings who were in a car who were both shot and then dragged out of their car. So that also wasn't, you know, with Hirsch from the bomb shelter. And uh, Roni, who was uh, working security at the music festival, was kidnapped from the festival. And Hirsch was in a bomb shelter a little bit away. So it's not crazy that people hadn't heard of him, right. seen him. Also, his name is unusual. You know, a Yiddish name is, and they hadn't heard his name. And of course, his most distinguishing characteristic is he has one arm. And they had not seen anyone right. with one arm. You had mentioned that uh, you're speaking with a lot of high-ranking officials, both in Israel and America. Um, I believe you had you had the opportunity to meet with President Biden. Is there anything you can tell us about that exchange you had? Um, President Biden has been the most sympathetic and empathetic figure uh, who we've spoken to um, in a position of power. Um, you know, President Biden knows about loss. When he was a young man, his uh, wife and his daughter were in, and his two sons were in a terrible car accident, and his wife and daughter were both killed. Um, and just a few years ago, one of those two sons was um, you know, died um, of cancer. So he's familiar with loss. And in fact, on the, the first time that we spoke to him, which was um, already a long time ago on October 12th, we were having a call with him. And while we were on the call on the Zoom, there were only 12 of us on the call. One of the women who was on the call was already sitting Shiva for her daughter who had been found the day before. But she was on the call because her other daughter was her younger daughter was still missing. And while we were on the call, she got the knock on the door that they found her other daughter also dead. And she came back to this Zoom and she unmuted herself. We were all muted when someone was speaking. She unmuted herself and she was screaming, you know, in agony. And she said, They just told me they found my other daughter. So now within, you know, 24 hours, she lost both her children. And President Biden put his head in his hands and started to sob, you know. And it was a real human moment. Um, and we were all crying, all of us, with her. Um, but the whole administration and Congress uh, has been incredibly supportive to us, and not just supportive emotionally, which is important, but we know that they're doing everything they can do. And there's a bunch they can't tell us, you know, of course, when we meet, right. yeah. you know, last week there was a meeting with all the families that still have loved ones there who are American. And, you know, sometimes in those meetings, people will say, well, what are you doing and who are you talking to and what's the plan? And John and I always look at each other and we think they're not going to tell us that. And we understand, you know, that they can't say, well, we're secretly talking to so-and-so at 2.13 tomorrow morning. Um, right. So there's a lot that we don't know, but we, we are aware that they are desperately trying to get the remaining eight Americans and, and really all the people who are there. And President Biden always says that, you know, this is not to him just an American issue. He really feels this is a humanitarian issue and that he needs to really help get everybody home. Yeah. And, you know, it really doesn't matter really what anyone's politics are. You know, um, when it comes to this hearing the way that President Biden reacted, it, what it does is it, it makes him very human and that's what he is. Yeah. Right. At, 
me or anyone else like in my position as just being a spectator on the sidelines here. Um, obviously, we're, we're praying, we're doing everything we can. President is president and that's a job. And there's, there's, uh, there's policies that almost represent that person that you may agree with or disagree with, but a story like you just told, it cuts through all of that. Right. He is a father of children. He is a husband to a spouse. And I thank you for telling us that because yeah. that, it breaks down so many barriers. It's not about Democrat, Republican. It's not about which side anybody's on. This is about good versus evil. Well, we've had, that, that's what it is. True. And we've had, you know, there are a couple things. The first thing is we've met with over 20 senators. And what was really nice was at one point in the same room was a very conservative Republican and a very liberal Democrat. And they said, this is an American issue. We don't care what anyone's politics are. Nobody in America wants to see Americans held hostage. And they all got together and, you know, signed, you know, what we were working on, uh, bipartisan, you know, support yeah. to get all the hostages out. And that is very um, hopeful. And, you know, when I spoke last week in Geneva, I spoke about how we're living in a world that is so um, bifurcated, so divided. We love to say them and us. We love it. You know, we love to divide the world. Um, and it's become so dangerous and so hateful by doing that. And uh, I think that we really have to redefine how we walk through the world. Um, I don't think it's healthy for anybody. And, and I think it categorizes people in a way that's a false sense of divisiveness. You know, um, I think that we should be redefining the world as those who are willing and those who are not. And I think all over the world, there are people who are willing, who are scared, but are willing to say, I'm willing to compromise, even though I'm scared, even though I don't trust you, even though I'm suspicious, even though I'm in pain, even though I'm in trauma. And there are people who are not willing and want to keep the hate because group hate is fun. It's easy. Right. We all know it. I mean, I even back to, you know, when you're in kindergarten and you're first learning, you know, if you like the Yankees, you have to hate the Mets, you know, or whatever it is. Like we just, yeah. we're used to dividing the world into things that we love and things that we hate. But I think we've gotten to the point in the world where it's not serving us very well to be divided that way. We'll be right back to this episode. But first, a word from my friends at Pesach with Bordeaux. I'm so happy to be joining them for Pesach this year. And I hope to see you there. I actually have been with them a couple of years. This year, I'm, I'll be there, I guess, moderating some panels and, and doing some meaningful stuff, I hope. So hope to see you there. There's a great lineup of people. Mordechai Shapiro, Rabbi Jonathan Rietti, Rabbi Daniel Kalish, Shami Adar. Uh, Rabbi Ruvain Epstein, plus many others. So it is a jam-packed uh, Pesach of talent. They have such an amazing program set up, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So if you are in that parsha of going away Pesach, make sure you go Pesach with Bordeaux. Make sure to head to PesachWithBordeaux.com. You can email them at PesachWithBordeaux at gmail.com or give them a phone call, if you're old school, at 347-699-6120. Find out how we could be spending Pesach together at Bordeaux. I also want to mention a very important cause that has come to my attention, and that is Shomer Tzion. The Nof Tzion neighborhood overlooks the Temple Mount, the Harabayas, and it connects East and West Jerusalem. Um, what this organization, Shomer Tzion, does, they maintain a flourishing and living Jewish presence in the vicinity of hostile Arab villages, uh, Jabal, Mokhbar, from which acts of aggression are all too regular. Um, to this day, they have not experienced one loss or damage, thank God, due to 
Unexplainable Miracles. A big thanks goes to all the people who have supported Shomer Tzion. It's, it's a group of people who make sure that this area is protected, that Jewish people are able to live there and thrive and be protected. They need things such as uh, means of communication, bulletproof vests, lighting, security cameras, all to maintain the safety of the residents. So please go ahead, hit the link in the description in the show notes of this episode and support this amazing cause, Shomer Tzion. Now back to this episode. And I think that, you know, as religious Jews, what we've been seeing since October 7th is, is really, it's, it's really incredible. It's, it's the, the unity of the Jewish people. It doesn't matter if they wear a yarmulke, what type of yarmulke, whether it's a hat or no hat, none of, none of that matters anymore. You, you see people who previously probably could have been in the same room who are now hugging and singing together and dancing together. You see Haredim getting with IDF soldiers to take care of them, soldiers getting with Haredim. Those barriers are breaking down. Do you feel, does your family feel that happening in, in the Jewish world? And what does that do for you as, uh, as a family? Um, we definitely are feeling support from places we didn't think we'd feel support. And that's been really special and helpful. Um, someone sent us the night before Hanukkah started, someone sent us a picture of a Haredi yeshiva here in Yerushalayim where they were setting up Hanukkiot and each Hanukkiah had a name of one of the hostages on it, which was huge because obviously the kibbutzim that were affected were not religious kibbutzim and the kids who were at the music festival obviously were not keeping Shabbat if they were at this music festival. But all of the sudden the Haredi world was open to understanding Achenu be Israel, right? These are our brothers. And we know, I mean, the Rambam says the greatest mitzvah that you can perform is, uh, you know, Re- releasing captives and and to helping set free captives is the most important mitzvah and you know everyone does their part even if your part is davening and saying to him for Hirsch ben Perochana every day that is helping him and you know I daven every morning I've davened every morning for years this isn't a like okay now it's post October 7th and I'm Mima mikim kariticha Hashem. Like I'm, I am used to davening every day, um, but it means a lot to me that I know that people who are not like me are davening for for us and for all the hostages and and for Hirsch. Um, and what's been very helpful, and I've mentioned this before. You know, I say to Hillim all day. Um, I'm calling out to Hashem all day. And um, I think of Tehillim as a self-help book. You know, you'd pick the one that speaks to you at that moment. And this for sure is a period where the ones that are, you know, praising Hashem are a little challenging for me. The easier ones are, you know, the ones that David Amelech was saying when he felt like, where are you? <laughs> you know, where have you gone? <laughs> um I'll test their panecha um, but I'm trying to use my faith and my uh, relationship with God to get through this very, this most dark of times that anyone can imagine. I watched yesterday a, an interview on 60 Minutes with one of the released hostages, Yardin Rahman, um, and she told Leslie Stahl in, a, in the 60 Minute interview that while she was in captivity, she overheard her name being spoken about on the radio. Uh, her captives were, were listening to it. Um, and from that report, she was able to figure out that her, her husband and her daughter, their names were mentioned, so they were likely to, to be alive. It gave her some, you know, I guess some hope. Um, I can't say for sure that this is going to find its way onto a device in, in Gaza, anywhere. But, but if it does, if you could send a message to your son, Hirsch, uh, what would it be right now? Well, throughout the day from the get-go, I've had this mantra that I've been saying to him. I say, I love you, stay strong, survive. 
I love you. Stay strong. Survive. And uh, we're coming. Coming. Just stay strong. We're coming. Um, you know, I hope and pray all day long that I have the schus of hugging him and being at his wedding and holding his children. And uh, I hope I have the schus of having a long life and having him bury me and having my girls bury me and not, not the other way around. Man. And uh, he should know that he has a flight coming up. So he really. He's got to get over here. Flight. I mean, yeah, come on, Nachi. What the heck? Flight. I know. I know. Because I think he's, it was a cheap miss- ticket and I don't think we can get a refund. Oh, man. That's, that's <laughs> awful. So first you got a flight to catch. Yalla, let's go. Um, really, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, everyone who's listening to this will continue to have Hirsch's names on their lips and to Davin. And uh, hopefully by the time this airs, Hirsch will be home. Amen. And, Next time uh, you can meet him, you can interview him. But keep yes. keep davening for Hirsch Ben Peril Chana. I'm like straight out of the shtetl. Peril Chana. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate And you. Hirsch. I mean, come on, yeah. Hirsch. It's so cute. It's such a yeah. good name. Um, yeah. I keep saying, you know, he always complained about his name because Hirsch Goldberg Poland. It's like three last names. But now he should be so yeah. happy. Can you imagine? What if his name was like David Cohen? Then, I mean, right. it, it would be very difficult to find him now. Yeah, definitely makes it a lot easier. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Of course, make sure to leave a rating, a review, and subscribe. You know, we have been in touch with the Poland Goldberg family prior to recording this, and we'll be in touch afterwards. So please make sure you flood the comments with positivity and chizik for the family. Hopefully, by the time that this comes out, Hirsch will be home happy, healthy, recovering. But if not, we should all continue to daven. Please continue to storm the heavens for Hirsch and Peral Khanna. She mentioned in this episode how she says to Hillam so often, and this is our family. This is not just someone else that is going through a terrible, terrible time. The Jewish people are one connected people. So please storm the heavens. Keep davening for Hirsch and Peral Khanna. It's a shame we share good news very, very soon. Thank you for watching the Meaningful People podcast. Thank you for subscribing, hitting that little bell so you're notified every single time we post content here. We'll see you next week.